So Peter, I've been following your work closely over the last 15 years and more recently you've developed a classification system. Can you tell us how it all developed? Well, probably out of frustration, James, really. Um, uh, I suppose I was in, had trained as a manual therapist uh, 21 years ago. It seems quite a long time now. And um, uh, was working in clinical practice and seeing these different patients coming in who look very different to each other and who some responded and some didn't for these different uh, interventions you know, I'd been taught to do. And uh, there seemed to be some patterns that were consistent or uh, familiar with some of these different patients. And so I started to think in terms of, you know, what were the mechanisms that were underlying this disorder? So really on the basis of that, the first phase is to look at movement and, and, and observing that there are some movement characteristics of, of the way some of these people were moving. And some of these movement patterns seem to be highly provocative. And in fact, when we normalized them, they told, told us their pain got better. Uh, and so the first phase is really looking at this whole issue around movement. But in this time, um, there's been this huge explosion, I suppose, of research in the last 10, 15 years of understanding the nervous system, understanding cognitive and psychosocial factors that drive pain. Uh, and so uh, what has evolved is really a multi-level classification system for understanding the complexity of pain disorders uh, that cons considers pathoanatomical factors when they're significant, which we know are a significant factor for a maybe 10 to 15 percent of patients. Um, uh, physical factors in terms of movement behaviours uh, and, and movement patterns uh, that can be a factor uh, for a significant group of pati patients. Lifestyle factors um, like issues in terms of sleep, life stress, sedentary behaviour, physical activity, uh, as w and social factors like work-related factors, social cir circumstances uh, in terms of the family, etc. And then within the psychological domain, issues we know are very important with pain for people like with fear, um, a catastrophizing, hypervigilance, uh, anxiety, depression, all of these factors we know have an in interplay of the nervous system. Uh, and then considering dominance of factors within the nervous system, whether there is a major central drive of pain or whether the pain is more mechanically provoked. So the system is multi-leveled. It's integrated within the Quebec task force that does that basic triage or screening. And then there's this multi-level system of really like a clinical reasoning process that considers you know, central, specific versus non-specific drivers of pain, central uh, drivers versus um, you know, uh, peripheral nociceptive input, uh, and then uh, behaviours and movement, and then considering the psychosocial and lifestyle domain. So it, it sounds complex, but in fact, in a clinical reasoning system, it's trying to make simple what is complex, which is the nature of pain. In nine, 2005, you published this uh, classification system, but since that time, you've developed your own and coined your own uh, system and coined a term called cognitive functional therapy. Can you yeah. tell us what cognitive functional therapy is? Well, that really, we spent a lot of time trying to work out what to call this approach because there's a lot of literature around exercise and there's a lot of literature around cognitive behavioural therapy uh, for pain. And we didn't see that that really captured either of this approach at all. What we saw is this is a mind-body approach that considers both the beliefs, the emotions, the cognitions of a person, the fears, the, all of those factors, and the behaviours of movement. Uh, and so to capture that, the approach that we have is a very integrated approach that, that really looks at changing behaviour as a means of changing cognition or beliefs. And so that's why we've called it cognitive functional therapy, to encapsulate this idea of this is a cognitive and behavioural approach of changing, of, of dealing with movement behaviours and a means of dealing with pain, if, if those behaviours are a driver of pain. But this is quite different to core stability or... Yeah, it's complete. It, well, approach. it's very, very different. I mean, uh, what we're finding in the research that we've been involved in is, in fact, that for people with disabling back pain, the motor system's overactive very often. The muscles are overactive and they can't switch off. Uh, and that's, that can be driven by ha habits of movement, habits of posture, um, fear, anxiety, stress, or just the presence of pain where you've developed a protective mm -hmm. guarding response. Um, so it's very different to that in the sense that we are really challenging um, behaviours of movement, which, which uh, you know, is, can be quite a challenging process to change with someone who is very fearful, for example. 
But how are you going to meet the challenge of um, introducing your CFT term and approach to the ensconced attitudes of lots of people in, on the, in the world on core stability training? How well, are you going to replace... Well, the, the, really, the, the, the concepts around stability of the spine haven't really delivered the results that people hoped. And, and look, I was, I was part of that 20 years ago, and I published a paper looking at spinal instability and stabilization training, and I, I was mistaken, actually, I think. Um, the word instability is not a, help, a useful word. Um, the idea that more is better, I think, is not the case with disabling pain. Um, we've been very um, interested in developing multi-levels of evidence to to look at the underlying processes that are involved with these pain disorders. Uh, and there's a recent study trial that's been conducted in Norway which has compared cognitive functional therapy to traditional manual therapy and stabilisation training and the results you know, significantly superior in terms of reductions of pain, disability, uh, episodes of pain, reductions in fear, changes in mood, uh, less time off work, less need for ongoing treatment. So there's substantial evidence developing now to suggest that this, this approach actually has a, has a better outcome. And at the end of the day, you can have an idea, but you have to test it. Uh, and if the research doesn't support it, uh, then you can't advocate it. So we're really at a stage now of saying, well, it looks like this approach does have efficacy. How are we going to translate that knowledge? Well, we have to do it in many different ways. We're setting a network up of people who, can, uh, who are skilled in training in the system. We know it takes a, a number of hours about 100 hours to learn the system. Uh, we're developing um, uh, learning tools and teaching tools that we can put on the internet is what we're after to try and disseminate this information to, to change the beliefs around uh, the body essentially uh, and the way the body moves and the strategies in which we can take to, um, to change that. Now, do you think it's the physiotherapists who are best equipped to take this forward in the future? Um, or will you be looking at other uh, paramedical professions. Yeah, I, th I think the, the knowledge of, well, the understanding of multidimensional nature of pain is something that anyone dealing with pain, I think, has to, to learn. We're interested in developing a system uh, that, that could be understood by anybody, if, if the patients as well, uh, and developing an intervention system. I think physiotherapists are probably best to deliver that because they have traditionally good understanding of pain, pain mechanisms, they have a good understanding of movement, of movement training, uh, and um, you know, of course this work has evolved within that profession, so I suppose I'm biased in that sense. But do you see any problems in, de in delivering this approach to physiotherapists and, and educating doctors and consultants? No, I think it's terribly approach. important that we educate the, the medical profession. I mean, I, I think we've seen in the last couple of days in this workshop uh, cases of people who have had an MRI scan showing a degenerate disc being told they can't be involved with manual work. Uh, well, we've seen examples of people who've gone back to doing the very thing they are told they can't do and they have no pain. Uh, so th I think there's a lot of fear out there within the medical profession around the structure of the spine uh, and that people have been given advice to, uh, you know, to be careful with their backs and, and to avoid doing things like loading their back and being involved in manual work or active work or physical activity in the fear they're going to do harm. And we know that fear is a huge driver of abnormal pain behaviour. So those are the, it's like a shift that has to happen, not just within the medical profession, also in the physiotherapy profession, other professions as well, as well as in the general public. But it's probably very timely because it's only yesterday on the, on the BBC that the facts were reported that there are 25% less people taking time off work and the advent of the fit note instead of the sick note. Yeah, we're living in a society where we're doing less and less uh, in terms of physical activity and so that's going to create a huge issue for the future in terms of obesity and all the other comorbidities that are linked to that and pain's part of that, that, that scenario. You know, backs shouldn't be feared. You know, backs are robust, strong structures that need to be considered in a, in a positive light and move well. So finally, is cognitive functional therapy for everyone? No, um, no, not at all. The, the classification system that we developed, we think is developed for everybody uh, because it is multidimensional and it, it allows you to do a sorting approach. The, this, this cognitive functional approach to, to management 
we think is useful for the complex patients as well as the middle and low level complexity patients. Um, for the complex ca cases, then there's a lot more attention to the psychological and the social factors that might be linked to a disorder in terms of directing management at that within a cognitive functional framework. But we're looking at, our interest is to return people to function. Uh, and the focus is on function, not on muscles. Now, there are some disorders out there, you know, specific pain disorders like, you know, radiculopathies and, and other disorders that training movement might, might be not beneficial at all and may be provocative. Uh, there are central pain disorders that we know, central nervous system pain disorders and regional pain disorders where just training movement can actually be um, provocative as well. So we're really interested, and this study that we've done has looked at people who are localised mechanically provoked pain, uh, and that's a logical group, and it's a large group of patients out there with back pain, uh, but it's a logical group that we have inter intervened with, and we think that's a logical intervention system for that group, uh, and there are a lot of other researchers who, who are looking at other strategies of management for these complex um, central nervous system pain disorders, but they are in a mon minority of the pain disorders that are out there in primary care. And for the majority of these disorders, I think this approach holds hope. So obviously further research needs to be done and we're involved in that. Research teams all over the world are involved in this area. It's a, we're on a progressive learning curve and it, we think it's an exciting area for the future. So the future looks very bright. Well, I'm hopeful, but I'm a hopeful guy. So, <laughs> um, but the, the indications from the work we're doing is that this looks to be better than what's currently out there. So, uh, it, but it's not just our work as well. You know, the work at Kiel University, I look at a stratification approach to, uh, um, to, to looking at prioritizing care on patients. I think that's a very, very important area of research as well, that we do direct our care to the people who need it. And we have used the Orobro system, developed by Stephen Linton, to address and identify these high-risk patients where there are the cognitive and psychosocial factors as well. So it's not like we're working in isolation. We're very interested in bringing the best of the, world, the research in the world to integrate into this system. And certainly from the physiotherapists who attend these workshops, they would f agree that it's career-changing on their treatment approach to patients? I think therapists develop a greater confidence to deal with pain, mm -hmm. a greater confidence to empower people to get back to doing the things that they want to do. And uh, we've been running this study actually looking at back pain beliefs and it looks like there's a significant shift across three days in the back pain beliefs of the physiotherapists who attend the workshops that they, they are much more hopeful about the possibility of um, people with pain to work and to, and that's their beliefs. So their beliefs are changing. We know that if our beliefs change, w that will transfer to the people we manage. So that's a, that's a, uh, um, a quantitative um, uh, approach to understanding that what we're doing does hold some, some benefit for, for, the, for the profession as well. So in many ways, you are rev revolutionizing the treatment approach of non-specific chronic low back pain? Well, I think what we're trying to do is really develop a system that is a logical system that people can use to inform better practice. Um, it's not to kind of box people, it's to try to, ha it's an opportunity to sort out the complexity of problems to, to um, better the lives of people with pain. So if that's what we've done, then I'm happy. Thanks, James.